God, dude, did you see Moderna's revenues? Like $60 billion from the U.S. government to buy these shots? Holy Lord. Yeah, but what's the margin on those? It's a pretty low margin, isn't it? Are they giving these things away pretty cheaply? Who cares, Brett? <laughs> it's $60 billion. But look, revenue is, is only part of the equation. How many Shark Tank companies? Well, I'll tell you. I watch over and over again these Shark Tank companies that are just like, oh, we had $3 billion in sales. And what'd you make of your negative? I'm talking about Moderna. And you just talked about <laughs> a, a place where like pretty pretzels advertises. No, I know. But margins, I don't think their margins are terrific because of the shots. I have no actual insight to this other than I know that most of the companies are giving away their shots for very, very little money. Yeah, I don't know. But that's like, dude, that's like freaking, um, it's like Popeye's, Popeye's chicken sandwich, tight margins. But God, you go buy a chicken sandwich, you're buying a soda, you're buying fries, you're buying whatever your stupid kid wants that's going to kill them. That's where the margin is. They get you with the chicken sandwich where they only make a dollar on the chicken sandwich or less than that. And then you buy the fries where they make all the monies. Yeah, well, I've, I've shopped frequently at the Moderna store before, and I love all the other items that they sell me. <laughs> Good morning, and welcome to Talk Your Chart. Brett, how are we doing? Marcos, I'm very excited today because behind you, we actually have some live furniture. I know, finally. One, there's one coming right up there that I'm excited about. It's going to be great. I think so. I mean, last time we talked in our, in our talk your chart about GDP, consumer uh, consumption, right? Yes. You just went up. There you go. I took that good news right to retail sales. Yeah. I mean, you're like out of a West Elm book right now. Thank yeah. you. I appreciate it. We're going to have to put some graphics behind my settings just so we have something to talk about next time. I love looking at the Murphy bed. I think it looks good. It was homemade. My father and I, thank you, Dad, put it together. Pandemic project. And okay. pretty well. That's Only excellent. four times as long as it should have, but the end result was successful. That's good memories. <laughs> yeah. So today, my talk, your chart is going to be a little bit unique. I'm going to okay. be talk your planning chart. And the reason what I want to talk about today is Social Security. Okay, that's exciting. I think, look, it affects all of us, right? So it's not just a boring topic that affects only certain people. Um, the average person is going to collect in their life 20 to 30 years of Social Security. And I think it's one of the most misunderstood discussions out there. Okay. And as you know, the Social Security handbook is over 2,700 pages. Um, you've read most of them, I'm sure, because you're a voracious reader. Precisely. I'm halfway there, if not a little more. Yeah. So it's, it's a confusing subject. I can tell you from my own experience going to the Social Security office, it's a place where they are con equally confused at a lot of rules that are out there. Um, it's understood given how many pages there are in the rule book. And if you weren't sure about it, uh, they're not there precisely always to help you. And the reason I said is because if you never went to the office, never called for benefits, they would never pay you anything. You know, they're not going to turn benefits on automatically. They're not going to readjust if you have a spouse pass away or something happens. You know, you've got to go to them and get your benefits turned on. Sure. It sounds like working with the government. You have to take a lot of action yourself. Why have you been to the Social Security office? So years ago, back in, I would say, 2007, 2008, there okay. were a lot of, of these unusual strategies that were out in the paper talking about, well, you could do this and then change to this. You could do this and then pay it back and do this later. So I went there with a mountain of, of research and said, you know, are these things legitimate? I know I'm hearing people do that, but I've never really read how that can be done. And they had no idea. I mean, I literally had to spend months trying to track down somebody from the Social Security press office to finally get some details on how things work. Okay. And now fast forward 10 years, 15 years, most of these things are, are by the wayside. A lot of strategies don't exist anymore. Uh, but what I found is that people still make very bad mistakes. Okay, that's reasonable. Probably a lot of clients say to you, Marcos, when should I take social security? Yes, and you know, let me, I'll, I'll give you a little bit of a shout out here because we obviously we get that question all the time because one of the big resources a lot of clients have is social security. They have to account for it some way or another. Um, dangerous at a certain extent, 
But without a doubt, at every client meeting, I always talk about our in-house expert, which, ladies and gentlemen, is Brett Horowitz. Yeah, I mean, I don't know everything that's out there. I haven't read all the 2,700 pages, but I know enough for the basics. And what I know is when someone says, when should I take Social Security? It's the wrong question. And the reason it's wrong is because they use the word I in there. And I think as we've seen, how you take Social Security will affect your spouse potentially, will affect your kids potentially, will affect a divorced spouse if you get divorced, or even more strongly, will affect your spouse if you get if you pass away. Okay. So I think the question has to be: when's the best time for us to take Social Security? And how does our how does one decision impact the other person's decision? Butterfly effect. Perfect. So what I want to share with you is a quick story of a client that I dealt with a few, a few weeks ago. This is a client who's still working. Uh, he's a lawyer in a downtown office, and he's just about to turn 66 years old. And he said, you know, I don't need the money. Um, I want to keep getting my generous 8% per year credit and waiting until age 70, uh, which we suggested he do. Um, but his wife had passed away uh, about a decade ago. And I said to him, well, we're not going to wait till 70. We're going to call Social Security when you turn 66 and get benefits. He said, I don't want benefits. I want to wait till 70. I said, no, you're missing something very important here. And the strategy is that what he didn't know is that he is eligible for widower benefits at 66 for four years. And then at 70, he would flip over to his own with having those four years of benefits having no impact on his future benefits. So the chart I'm pulling up here shows yes. an example of what would happen if he just stuck with his own benefits and eventually at 70 would collect about $33,000 or $2,772 per month. However, by just calling up Social Security and spending about an hour of time with them on the phone, he's now able to get close to $10,000 a year for the next four years, almost $40,000. And that will not impact his own benefits whatsoever. And that's money left on the table. They're not going to tell him that. He's the one that's got to know this. And, and I was about to tell you. So the hardest part about this is that he was expected to know this. Right. I don't think he would have known it. I mean, you've got to have probably somebody that has a deep knowledge of how Social Security works. Know that there's still these Social Security strategy loopholes and, and things to know about how it works. Um, yeah. The average person just, just doesn't doesn't want to know or doesn't have the knowledge to be able to make that important decision. Yeah, precisely. This is, um, you don't know what, it, what you don't know. And I was afraid you were going to get into some super convoluted analysis, break even and all that good stuff like you always do. And we appreciate you for doing many a time. But this is, this is a beautifully simplistic example of you need to know your benefits in order to take advantage of them. And I think the that, that famous planning process we talk about, that's where you uncover this stuff, right? Because you don't know this unless you know it. Right. Well, the other thing is everything you read online talks about your average family of, you know, 1.8 children. I haven't met anyone that's got 1.8 children. And so you can't just use the averages. You can't just use, well, you know, the average person takes it at this age or does this or does that. Each person is unique, right? And so the idea is you've got to break it down and say, okay, in your situation, based on this, these fact patterns, right? And the other thing is, when the system was created 1935 by FDR, the average life expectancy was 65. So you put in money all those years and you barely got anything out of it. Yeah. It's different. Now you're talking about money for the rest of your life, you're talking about inflation adjusted. Um, you're talking about tens of thousands of dollars every year as a big part of your retirement income. It's an important decision. I have had clients tell us in the past, tell me in the past that they liken our profession to being a firefighter. And I think that's a little bit of an overstatement, but their analogy is a firefighter every day is not putting out major fires. Sometimes it's saving cats from trees. Sometimes it's training or looking at fire hydrants, you know, making sure they all work. And that's what I think our role is, right? Not every day we're going to find $40,000 laying in her mattress. Provide somebody. But when you do, it's like, man, that pays for years of benefits that you would not have known otherwise. I'll take that analogy. You can be Mr. October <laughs> in the new calendar we'll publish. We'll talk about it offline. I think it's a good idea. Okay, so that's Social Security, which everyone's thinking about, but no one's really talking about. What's everybody talking about? 
I think everyone's talking about the fact that at this point in time, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, and Facebook are collectively worth more than $9 trillion. They own the world. They basically run things, right? Um, and this is, this is the, um, that, that's the, the sexy headline to start the valuations conversation that we can't get away from. And everyone's asking. We had, not a client that you and I work with together, but there were, there's a, a client that Catherine and I work on together that are selling a, a healthcare business. So they're going to come into a, a ton of cash. And obviously, w- once you end up with all this cash, whatever that amount is, do we invest now? Do we invest later? Do we wait for the correction? And then that suddenly becomes the market timing correction, which we know the story on that. Is it possible? Sure. Is it probable? No. Right. Because you have to get it right twice. I'm sure everyone knows somebody that might have sold in beginning of February last year and said, ha, I, I missed the drawdown, but they still haven't reinvested. Right. So, so how well did that work out? So the valuation question, we can't get away from it. And a chart that um, that sparked my interest, I don't know how much conclusion I'm drawing from it, but I thought it was interesting to see was the earnings contribution of the top 10 in the S&P 500. So the top 10 is what we talked about a couple of weeks ago and what we all know, those big tech companies. I think Berkshire, uh, a, a bank is also in there. But so the top 10 of the S&P represent 30% of the weight, which is a ton, right? And historically speaking, that's just off the highs. But what I thought was very interesting is that that same top 10 contributes 34% of the earnings, right? So and we were joking good. about this before. That either means these companies are printing money, which they are, or it could also mean the other 490 are just crappy companies. Exactly. I mean, it's, it can be a very scary thing, I think, when you think about it. You say, my gosh. And we've seen articles written how much of the past decade's run of the market has been because of those 10 companies, right? And so you look at it and say, well, if they falter, oh my gosh, we're gonna have a big downturn just because of these 10 stocks. On the other hand, they haven't faltered in so long. And so you look at it and say, thankfully they've done so well and that's why the market's gone up so fast. Yeah, I, it, it makes a ton of sense. And I think one conclusion you can draw from this is these companies are incredibly valued, call it overvalued, but it's for a reason these things print money, right? Um, how do you, what do you do? There's a risk there, right? There's a concentration risk. Everyone who has a market-based portfolio is expressing this risk. How do you correct for that? What do you do to de-risk that type of portfolio? The obvious thing is own less of those companies, right? There's things that we've looked at on the investment committee that I've looked at personally. I'm sure you've looked at. There are different exchange traded funds that are, that are reverse cap-weighted or equal cap-weighted. So you basically get away from allocating the most money to the largest companies. And you say, I'm just going to allocate an equal percentage to all 500 companies, which sounds wonderful in theory, but we all know humans are humans. And once you see your portfolio doing something different than the broad market, you're not going to love it. You're going to be unhappy with it. So the question you need to ask yourself as an investor is how much deviation are you okay with? Right. Well, and for us, I think internally, we're trying to on the edges and on the margins of, of a client's portfolio, de-risk and get away from those larger names just because they're the elephant in the room. The problem is what we just said. They're the elephant in the room because they've earned it. This is not just affecting our clients. This is affecting almost everyone. Right. We've seen a, exactly. a huge increase in index funds owned by individuals. We've seen that active has not worked in a long time. Passive or owning just the market has been a much better outcome. So almost everybody in a 401k or outside of that owns an index fund. And this problem that you're talking about, these 10 companies getting bigger, has only gotten bigger every single year for the last 10 years, right? So these companies were big 10 years ago. They're now even bigger now. Every year they keep doing better. They keep getting bigger. And so you've got a lot of people who are all tied up in the fate of these 10 companies. Yeah. And I don't know how you get away from that um, just because they're not going anywhere. Innovation through technology is not going anywhere. You can look to China and see what's happened there. In my personal opinion, I think that's going to stifle innovation. Um, I think that's good for us. I think at the, at the end of the day, you look at it and say, here's an index with 500 companies and I'm getting not that much exposure from more than 90 of them. 
or um, you know, still 70%, but it's, each one's a very small percentage. Even if I were to buy a, you know, a thousand or 2000 or 3000 companies, every index is going to be waived to these 10 companies. Yeah. Basically the rise and fall of a lot of the gains in the market or losses is going to be based on these 10 companies. And that's a scary thing. If you look at it that way, or it's a tremendous opportunity based on how well they're doing. Yeah. I, I would lean into opportunity because this is how markets have worked forever. And what it really is, is you're investing in a factor and that factor is called momentum. That's what that is. Well, on the short term, I, I'm scared though, you meant brought up last time about how much of the top 10 changed from last decade to this decade, right? Yeah. Now something's gonna fall and that's gonna be a big impact. Now, thankfully the indexes indices will move accordingly with that, right? So if Apple falls out of the top 10, something else is in, in its place. You know, it'll adjust its weighting accordingly. But you know, that could be a scary thing too if all of a sudden the, the top 10 are rotating out. Yeah, it will be. And yeah, it'll be a market mover and we'll be talking about it. And we will be looking to take advantage of any opportunity the market gives us. Right now, we haven't seen any. The market falls by 2% and people are a little worried. <laughs> we're, we're like 48 new highs this year. We're a percent or two off all-time highs. I think we're doing fine. Right, but I would take 50 at least. I and mean, if we can't get to 50, it's a pretty bad year. That's a good number. Yeah. H, thank you. All righty. Talk soon, my friend. Bye.